But the negative side comes next. Look at what happens. Verse 19. Do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. This is the hard part in church, when people are not happy with you. When you've done something that has offended someone or that you've done something wrong. You know, as, as a pastor, sometimes I feel like I can't win. I say this in a, in a sermon or a message, and then I go, I, I wonder how they heard that. Maybe now they're going to be upset. So I try to say it this way, and then I wonder, well, maybe then those people are going to be upset. And I assume that that's what was happening in the early church, that sometimes these elders and these leaders who would teach, they would do something or they would say something, and right away someone would come up and say, well, the pastor said this. We need to get rid of our pastor. We need to get rid of our elder. And Paul says, you know what? Do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. That was part of the Jewish legal system. You couldn't condemn someone for murder on the basis of one witness. There had to be two or there had to be three. He says it's no different in the church. If your pastor or your elder has made a mistake or he has sinned, and somebody is just spreading gossip or he's just talking about him and, and trying to run him down, he says, that's not good enough. That if he truly has failed, then two or three people had better know about it before you come to him and face him with these accusations. Our leaders should be disciplined fairly. One of the most difficult things as a parent is discerning when the accusations of one of our children against the other is true. So one of the children will come running to us and say, Daddy, 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 uh, Sasha pushed me down. Okay, Sasha, did you push him down? No. Sasha, did you push him down? No. Um, Chandler, did anyone else see Sasha push you down? Um, no, Dad, nobody else was around. I say, well, one of you is telling the truth and one of you is not. Chandler, did Sasha push you down? Yes, Dad. Sasha, did you push Chandler? <laughs> yes, Daddy. Are you going to spank me? I don't want a spanking. But it's hard because it's just one person against the other person. Now, if all four of our children are in the backyard playing, and one of the children punches the other child and the other three see, then it's easy. So they come running into the house and, and maybe Sasha Sasha got hurt. All right, Sasha, what happened? Well, Landon hit me. Did anybody else see it? So Michaela and Chandler come in and say, Yes, Dad, we saw Landon hit Sasha. Landon, did you hit Sasha? I did. But she, and then he goes into some explanation of what she did to him. But having witnesses is very important because it validates the claim. And so many times in church, people talk about all kinds of things or different leaders in the church or they're talking about the pastor and you say, I don't know who's telling the truth. If the leader has sinned and there are two or three witnesses, here's what's supposed to happen. Look at verse 20. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest may stand in fear. Here's a principle for you. Never listen to gossip about leaders or even a serious accusation if it only comes from one person. Never listen to gossip. Never listen to a serious accusation if it only comes from one person. But as verse 20 says, if it can be proven that the pastor or leader has continued to sin over and over again, he must be confronted. And did you notice how he is confronted? He needs to be rebuked in front of them all, which I assume to mean the entire congregation. I can't imagine how hard that would be. So let's, let's create a bad example, a serious example. Let's suppose that I have been cheating on my wife. I've been having an affair. I'm not, so I'm just creating this story. I love my wife. I'm being faithful to my wife. But for sake of our example, I've been cheating on her. I have a mistress. I thought it was being kept a secret. I was still preaching my sermons. The church is still growing. Someone finds out about my affair. Somebody talks. 
Not just one person, but two persons and three persons. When it is found out what I have done, I am confronted and I say, no, that's not true. And they'll say, well, we have witnesses. We have more than one witness. Pastor Bruce, are you willing to repent? I say, no, I'm not willing to repent. It's not true. I am faithful to my wife and I'm lying. So what they do, they call a congregational meeting and they bring me into that congregational meeting and they say, Pastor Bruce has been unfaithful to his wife many times. He is unwilling to repent. We rebuke him in the presence of this entire congregation. Can you imagine what that would be like? We had a situation like that in our church, similar to that. <clears throat> I came to Bethel 13 years ago. I was Bethel's first associate pastor. They had never had one before. I was their first. Well, in my first year, there was the revelation that the senior pastor was having an inappropriate relationship with a woman that he was counseling. And so, in, in the summer of that year, the elders confronted him and he said, oh, it's just a counseling relationship. And they said, we have someone who saw you holding her hand. You're married. You need to end this relationship. No problem. There is no relationship. It's done. That was in May, I think it was. In early November, there came a report that the relationship had continued. And I'm just new to being a pastor. My stomach is just in knots. I, I'm having trouble sleeping. This is horrible. They did some investigation and found out that the pastor and this woman had been meeting on a regular occasion. We didn't know if it was sexual or not, but it was definitely inappropriate. So one night, two other leaders and myself called him in to visit with him. Pastor, we have solid evidence that you are not being faithful to your wife. It's not true. He was defiant. He was angry. He said, I'm going to just resign. I said, Pastor, you may need to step aside, but we will offer counseling. We will offer you help and assistance. He said, I'm not going to do it. I've, I've, I've had accusations in the past before, and I quit. I'm not going to I'm not going to admit to what you're saying to me. I'm done. I'm finished. That was on a Thursday or Friday. And it was decided that he was not going to preach on Sunday. I had to come up with a message in 2 days to preach on church on Sunday. He never preached again. What we asked him to do was to have a congregational meeting. The elders would say something. They wouldn't tell everything. They were trying to protect the church from the explicit information. But they tried to explain to the congregation what had happened. And then he was supposed to get up and explain to them what he was going to do. But he didn't tell the whole truth. And when that meeting was over, I wish we could wind the clock back and do it all over. When that meeting was over, people came up to him and gave him hugs and wished him well. He said he was moving to another city. They thought he was moving with his wife and his two children. He wasn't. He was moving by himself and he was leaving his wife and his two children behind. And I remember his wife was sitting in the back of the church when all this was happening. People came to her husband to express love, but not to her. And that was horrible. That we as elders should have been more explicit and said, this pastor has sinned. He is leaving his wife. He's not only not going to be your pastor, you need to know that he has been living a lie. We did not get specific enough. We tried to be careful to protect the church, but in being careful, we actually damaged his wife, who from that point forward stayed in the church, but began to resent the church, resent the leaders, because we had not done all that we could have done. We did some of what we could have done, but not all that we could have done. Paul says, Timothy, if 
the leader persists in sin, he must be rebuked. And, and so that the rest may stand in fear, that there may be this sense of awe and the presence of God there, because this is God's house. Remember, again, with Paul, it's always about the gospel. If we have leaders who are not faithful and not living the gospel in their lives, it damages their reputation in the community. 21 says this, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. He is invoking all of the spiritual powers that he can. Timothy, this is so important. I charge you in, all, in the presence of Jesus Christ and of God and of the elect angels, you have to do this that if the foundation of the church through its pastors, its teachers, its leaders is falling apart, the church and its gospel witness is going to fall apart. He says in verse 22, Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands or take part in the sins of others. Keep yourselves pure. When he talks about the laying on of hands, that's like an ordination. So when a pastor comes into a church, if you have a particular installation service where the leaders come and lay their hands upon you and install you and invest in you the authority to lead that church, he said, don't do that too quickly. Timothy, you need to know these leaders. You need to examine these leaders so that they are tested and that they are true. I think of the, the, the principles regarding sin in Matthew 18 where Jesus said, go one on one, go two or three to on one, and if that brother repents, that he can be restored to faith, and if not, it goes to the congregation. Timothy, if there's ongoing sin, I invoke God the Father and Jesus Christ and the elect angels. You must address this for the sake of the gospel witness of your church. Don't make these leaders too quickly or too fast. Verse 23 in my Bible has a, has a quote, uh, parenthesis around it. it. It's almost like it made Paul think of a thought that didn't relate to the text, but he thought about something in Timothy. He says, Timothy, no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and for your frequent ailments. Why would he say that? He's talking about living as a leader with a life of integrity. And there were people, the aesthetics, who in that culture said, don't do this, don't do that, don't do that, don't drink any alcohol at all, don't drink any wine at all. And as if Paul says, now Timothy, as people look at your life and they criticize you for this, and they criticize you for this, and they criticize you for that, Timothy, you need to take a little wine for the medicinal impact on your stomach. Don't get so worried and so paranoid about what they think about what you're doing and living your life that you don't take care of yourself. See, again, Timothy and I have so much in common. I worry so many times about what people think about me. And I end up living my life for the sake of other people and not for my own health. In America, we call that codependency. In other words, I'm dependent upon what you think about me. That if you don't like me, then I don't like myself either. So therefore, I try to please you, and I try to please you, and I try to please you. All that to help me make me feel good about myself. And Timothy was to have been the same way. Paul says, Timothy, have integrity, but if you need to take care of your health, and that involves a little wine, and people are upset because you drink a little wine, don't worry about what they think. You have to take care of yourself. After verse 23, he concludes his thought with verse 24 and 25. The sins of some men are conspicuous, going before them to judgment, but the sins of others appear later. So also good works are conspicuous, and even those that are not cannot remain hidden. Hey, Timothy, sometimes you just can't see people's sins. And I go, amen to that. When I'm in church on a Sunday morning and I'm standing in that pulpit and everybody, if your churches are like ours, usually everybody puts on some nice clothes and the women's hair is done nicely and they, they look very attractive and the men are kind of dressed up a little bit. I can't tell if one person from the other is a particular sinner or not. Everybody seems relatively happy and they're glad to be there. We, we call it putting on masks. That when we walk into the church, we put on our mask because we don't really want people to know what we're really like down at the heart level. And Paul says, when it comes to sins, you can see it in some people. 
but you can't see it in others. But they're going to turn up later. I think of the verse that says, Be sure your sins will find you out. Sometimes I watch a person over a period of time and I say, when I think back to how that person looked three months ago, their face just seems more worried and more tired than they used to be. I wonder what's going on. Maybe it's just a family matter or a situation in their home, or maybe it's a matter of sin. But Paul says, listen, you can see some sins in people's lives, but others, you might not only see them later. That's just a reality in the church. Timothy, be faithful. But he says good works is the same. Sometimes you can see people's good works, and sometimes there are good works done that you'll never know about. I have this friend in our church who loves to work behind the scenes. He, he wants to do good things for people, but he doesn't want them to know about it, and he loves that. There are other people who do things in a more public way, and I say, hey, you know what, that's just fine. But the, 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 the main thing is to keep the priority of the gospel witness of our church in the communities in which we live. That we do good works not so that people glorify us, but that they glorify God. That their attention is on the God of the universe who sends His Son Jesus Christ to bring life and hope and health to the, the people in our communities that so desperately need Jesus Christ. But Paul uses this whole section to talk about leaders, how they're compensated, how they should be taken care of, how they should be honored if they're serving well. And he gives a very strong warning to say, listen, and when they continue in sin, you have to address them severely. You have to look at the problem right in the face and say, this is what we must do. Because sometimes only God knows the heart. But that you leaders need to be in such tune with God's heart that He gives you the insight to know what to do in any given situation. Even a small contribution can make a big difference. Jesus fed over 5,000 people because of a little boy's five loaves. Regardless of the amount, your contribution is very important and greatly appreciated. Visit us at www.tvseminary.com. I'm convinced that being a part of a church in the 21st century is very difficult, very complicated. And honestly, I don't think if it matters if there's 20 people in your church or 200 people or 2,000 people. These are very complicated times. And our people live in complicated situations and complicated relationships and complicated family situation. It takes leaders with integrity and character to be able to lead. Perfect? No. I'm not perfect. None of the leaders that I serve with are perfect. But we serve a holy God who is continually, continually sanctifying us into the image of His Son, Jesus Christ, that we think more like Him, that we live more like Him. When we get done with a passage like this, I, I wonder sometimes if some who hear this or read this say, I never want to be a leader. If that's how hard it is, I never want to be a leader. I don't want that kind of scrutiny. I don't want people looking at my life. Uh, there are times when I say that too. I remember one meeting where I left crying and I, I said, I wish I was farming again. I wish I could sit on a tractor or I wish I could sit on a combine and just tune out the world. But let me tell you something. As hard as there are days at being a pastor of a church, there are also days of incredible blessing. God called me to this work. God asked me to do this and I said yes. Some of the reward that I get I see in this life through the people whose lives change. And honestly, probably most of the reward that I'm going to get I'll see in glory one day. I don't know what it'll be. But for those of you who are thinking about leadership in the church, don't run away from it. If God is saying something in your heart and you say, you know what, my church is not perfect, but I feel like I should be involved. Maybe you need to answer that that. that call that God is putting on your heart and saying, I will do whatever you ask me to do. I will do it with your strength. I will do it with your joy. I will do it with your peace. I will do it with the gifts that you give me. And at the end of my life, I trust that you'll be able to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Because you have such a heart and a passion for the world. It's the gospel. It's always about the gospel. Well, with that statement, we come to the end of chapter 5. We've looked at three groups of people, a general group of people. We've looked at the widows. 
we've looked at the leaders or the elders. And when we come back next time, we're going to look at slaves and their response. And when we come back next time, we're going to begin to work our way to the end of this first letter. So with that in mind, we're going to take a break. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.